Uh, hello, uh, my name is Leonard Chan, and I work for the toolchain team for Fuchsia, the operating system. Uh, we're in charge of providing compiler benefits and maintaining the Clang toolchain for Fuchsia. And today, my talk is going to be on a relatively new feature that was introduced in Clang called Relative VTables in C++. So this is the agenda I have planned out. I'm essentially going to cover what are VTables, what are relative VTables, benefits, drawbacks, and impact of relative VTables, some, some of the work put in, and future improvements. So first, a little crash course on what are VTables. So VTables, or virtual tables, are essentially arrays of virtual functions. And a virtual function is essentially a member function of a C++ class that can be overridden or redefined by children classes. This is normally used via the virtual keyword in C++. And vtables and virtual functions are used to implement runtime polymorphism in C++ through dynamic dispatching. So this is an example layout of what a vtable would look like under the hood for the Itanium C++ ABI. Uh, the point here, uh, the main point here is that it's the vtable is just an array of various eight byte components that contains stuff like offset the top, which is needed for multiple inheritance, uh, runtime type information or RTTI, which is used for providing uh, information about a class at runtime, and then various virtual functions that the class may implement. So this is an example of what a vtable would look like in assembly, more specifically under the ELF binary format. So some things to note here. Uh, this is the vtable for class A. Uh, note that in assembly, we're using the mangled names uh, for each of these words, but the demangled names are right next to them in comments. This is the vtable for class B. And this is an example of loading and calling a function for a virtual table. So some important things to note here. Uh, both of these vtables are located in data rel row, which is a modifiable data section. And it's inside this modifiable data section because they contain dynamic relocations. Now, what's important about these dynamic relocations? So for ELF code, so for ELF, if you compile uh, your code with PIC or position independent code, it means that references to symbols with inside a PIC binary are not known until they're actually loaded into memory. And a relocation is essentially a process of resolving these references. And dynamic relocations specifically are uh, resolving these relocations after uh, uh, a program is loaded into memory by the dynamic linker. So you'll see in this table here, uh, the vtable contains references to functions like a foo and a bar, but we don't know where they're uh, loaded into until the binary is loaded. And it's also worth noting that each of these uh, symbols could be located outside of the current binary. So this is just an example to illustrate that uh, the actual addresses for these symbols can be technically anywhere depending on where the binary is loaded. Now, what does this mean for vtables? It means that vtables are still technically writable up to uh, at least that dynamic link time. It has to be writable so that these dynamic relocations can be patched. And data that's mapped into a writable section are actually mapped to something called copy on write pages. Now, a copy on write page is essentially a page that's shared between multiple processes, but only up until it's written to. At that point, the page is cloned for that process. So what this means is if a binary that's shared between n processes has a copy on write page, then there could be up to n different copies of a single copy on write page in memory. Now, what does this mean for vtables? It means that they're not pick friendly, uh, at the very least for binaries that are pick and use the itanium C++ ABI for these cases. Vtables can, can contribute to the number of copy on write pages, which means that they can use a lot of memory. And at the time, in Fuchsia, roughly 30 megabytes of memory was going to these modifiable data segments. And we found out that a sizable proportion of these was from vtables. So how can we address this? With relative vtables, which aims to make the vtables more pick friendly. So the relative vtables C++ API was 
a space efficient ABI proposed by Peter Gollingborn back in 2016 that essentially uses a pick friendly encoding of V tables. Now, what this means is that the virtual function pointers within a V table are replaced with PC relative offsets. And what this does is it changes the dynamic relocations to static relocations. So inside a binary, you could actually think of each symbol as being some constant offset from the start of the binary. So regardless of where the address is loaded, uh, regardless of where a binary is loaded into memory, you can think of every symbol as an offset from the start of wherever this binary is loaded into memory. Now, this is good because um, if we were instead to take the uh, relative offsets between each of the, the symbols within a binary, then that means the actual offsets themselves are going to be constant within that same binary. And this changes the dynamic relocations inside of eTable to static relocations, which can be resolved at link time when you're building or compiling your binary. And to demonstrate why this is good, uh, you'll see here that regardless of where we load uh, the DSO or a binary into memory, uh, the offsets uh, with inside the vtable are still going to be the same, which is good. Uh, one other added benefit for this is if uh, your binary was built using the small memory model, then that means your binary is going to be at most four gigabytes in size, which means that uh, we can limit the size of our offsets to 32 bits instead of the 64-bit uh, uh, pointers that we were using before. This effectively means that the size of our V table could be cut in half. So here is an example in assembly of what a V table looks like under the Itanium ABI. And this is an example of a V table under the relative V tables ABI. Now, there's a couple of things to point out here. Um, the virtual function pointers have now been replaced with offsets between the PLT entry for a given function and the third and essentially the, the, the start of V table plus an offset. Uh, that offset is necessary because within instances of objects of each class, um, there is a reference to the V table, but it's not necessarily to the start of the V table. It's actually a reference to the first uh, function within that V table which in this case is eight bytes into the start of the new vtable. What's also important to note is that the vtables are now in RO data, which is a pure read-only uh, section, meaning that vtables can be shared between processes now, and the vtables are no longer writable. Uh, one other major thing to note also is that because uh, we are now storing offsets instead of the pointers directly in the vtable, we're gonna need at least one extra instruction for adding the offset back to the start of the vtable in order to actually find the virtual function that we want to load and call. So earlier I mentioned uh, pick friendly encodings, and I want to emphasize that uh, uh, this isn't a new technique. This has been applied before for unwind info, and uh, someone on my team also, Gulfum, has uh, used this methodology and applied it to table lookup optimizations. Uh, this is also currently used in profile formatting, and it's also worth noting that Swift already uses this for metadata. So benefits, drawbacks, and impact of relative V tables. Uh, one of the main benefits is that there's no dynamic relocations of V tables. This means that V tables can be pure read only and shared between processes. Having no dy dynamic relocations means there's also a faster startup time because the dynamic linker has fewer relocations it needs to patch at runtime. This also has the lower memory impact because now that these vtables are read-only, they don't contribute to copy on write pages, so there could be fewer of them. Uh, for 64-bit uh, platforms, it's also worth noting that the vtable sizes can be cut in half. Uh, this leads to a binary size decrease with a little gotcha, which I'll go into later, uh, but this also has lower uh, memory impact because the vtables themselves are smaller. So some of the drawbacks uh, noted earlier is uh, potential text increases because uh, accessing the vtables requires at least one extra function for adding the offset. On ARH64, this uh, is only one extra needed instruction, but for x86-64, a few extra instructions may be needed, but there's still some room for improvement here. 
Uh, it's worth noting that this dot text increase can counter the dot data decrease. Uh, one un, one uh, drawback that we didn't see until after rolling this out was that uh, compressed uh, binaries can see some size regressions. Uh, this is likely because that within like a binary as a file, it's actually just filled with zeros inside the V tables. Uh, but now these V tables are filled with random integers, which are the offsets. And when compressing, a sequence of zeros compresses a lot better than a sequence of pseudo random integers. Uh, one of the biggest drawbacks also for this is that this is an ABI change. And uh, uh, this means that binaries that uh, expose the C++ ABI, or more specifically V tables, will not necessarily work uh, if um, the other binary that depends on those V tables isn't using the same API. Uh, this is uh, relevant for libraries like libc++, which exposes a lot of V tables, like iOS underscore base and its various descendants. Um, if your lib, if your user application isn't uh, uses libc++, but isn't combined with rel, but is compiled with relative V tables, but your libc++ isn't, then those two won't work together. But if you're using something like sanitizers, then you have uh, an, a user application compi compiled with relative V tables. You don't necessarily need RV compliant compiler runtimes because they don't expose any V tables. Uh, it's worth noting also that uh, this is still okay for Fuchsia because Fuchsia does not inherently depend on the lid, on the C++ API and Fuchsia is free to change it at any point. For user applications also, Fuchsia operates on a bring your own runtime model, which means that users bring their own libc++ ABI, their own libraries, and whatever they need under the hood to work to get their applications working. Uh, it's essentially a sandbox environment, and you can think of it kind of like Flatpak for Linux, which Peter Hosek will be giving in a later talk uh, at another time in this conference. Uh, it's also worth noting that on Fuchsia, there's no concept of a system libc++ that user programs can depend on. So they'll need to bring in their own libc++. And just to go on some numbers for Fuchsia, um, overall, we saw roughly about 20 megabytes of uh, overall memory saved from various end-to-end -end tests, which is good. That's the main uh, benefit that we were aiming for. In terms of uh, size savings, we didn't see that much. Uh, that could be because of a balance between the dot text increase and dot data increase. Uh, for Fuchsia as a system also, uh, Fuchsia, the Fuchsia system doesn't necessarily use a lot of V tables. We see them more from user applications. So it could be that any V tables affected uh, by this, uh, any size savings from this could be lost within the page rounding if it doesn't exceed the four uh, kilobyte page rounding. Uh, it's also worth noting that we didn't see any measurable performance difference, uh, which uh, uh, could be expected from these extra instructions, but uh, it's good that we didn't see any uh, measurable regression from this. So I'm gonna spend some time uh, going into the work effort or lessons learned uh, that, uh, or work put in that was uh, uh, done for this project. So. Some of the first work is introducing a new static relocation. So when experimenting with this, uh, we had um, uh, we had a relocation under the, that worked for x86 uh, that allowed us to create a PLT entry. Uh, the PLT is essentially this DSO local data structure that's emitted by the linker, and it uh, it uh, contains veneers for uh, functions with inside that binary. We wanted something to x86's uh, relocation that emitted a PLT entry, uh, but for ARCH64. And part of the effort for landing this project was introducing that. Uh, this also required adding a new IR construct. This one's called DSO local equivalent. Uh, this particular struct or this particular IR construct is necessary because it provides an IR specific and platform independent way of ensuring that a PLT entry uh, gets emitted under the hood when uh, uh, 
during function lowering. One also uh, one thing also worth mentioning is that um, in the examples that I gave, um, uh, they were compiled with F no RTTI, meaning that uh, the pointer to the RTTI struct was essentially zero and not given. So in this example, I have uh, an example where RTTI is given. And this is uh, how the relative vtables API works with RTTI. So some things worth noting. Um, the pointer to the RTTI struct has now been replaced with a PC relative offset between uh, a proxy object for the type info object and the vtable. Now, the RTTI proxy is actually just a data structure that contains a reference to the original type info itself. But the key thing to know about it is that it's, D it's made DSO local, so it's inside the same uh, binary as the vtable. This is needed because uh, it's not guaranteed that the type info for a given class is actually going to be inside the same binary as the vtable. So this allows us to still get that static uh, relocation um, and make the vtable read only still. One other thing worth noting is that both RTTI proxy and the type info struct are both because they contain dynamic relocations. And uh, as a result of the previous change, uh, this also requires changes to libc++ ABI, uh, namely because libc++ ABI implements uh, a dynamic cast, and the implementation for a dynamic cast needs to account for uh, adding the relative offset back to the start of the vtable. I'm not going to go through this code, but this uh, this is essentially uh, what it does under the hood now. So future improvements. Um, I'm only going to talk over these briefly, uh, but um, since this talk is recorded, um, feel, you can pause the video and look at the slides uh, at your own leisure. Um, whole program devirtualization. So right now, uh, WPD doesn't actually work well with relative V tables because WPD does some particular pattern matching to find interesting loads to V tables, but uh, relative V tables are actually loaded by a special intrinsic called Elevian load relative, which uh, it does not currently account for. Using the global offset table instead of RTTI proxy, this is good because similar to the PLT, it would be good. To, it would be nice to take advantage of a linker uh, emitted data structure instead of custom proxies that we make ourselves. And this also helps prevent bloating up the symbol table with all these RTTI proxy symbols. Compatibility with Wasan and Globals, um, extending support to other platforms. Uh, currently, we've only implemented support for 64-bit ELF on ARC64 and X64, but the general idea could be extended to other platforms in our, uh, other platforms in binary formats like COF or MACO. Uh, raising pick-friendly awareness. Um, as mentioned before, this uh, isn't an entirely new concept, but we could take this even further and apply this to other languages, other data structures, making this uh, uh, more usable in C and C++ through attributes. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Um, if you want to use relative V tables, uh, then you can uh, use it by just adding this flag in your build and using the appropriate version of libc++. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that even though it says experimental in the name, uh, this feature is fully production ready and usable, and it's used by default for Fuchsia. So if you're building a Fuchsia application, you're going to be using relative vtables by default. And I want to also thank you, uh, say thank you to the reviewers who helped me uh, review and land this code along the way. Uh, thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for a great talk, Cleo. Uh, I would also like to remind uh, attendees to use the Q&A box to submit uh, their questions. Uh, we are gonna start uh, with a question uh, from Nathan Sidwell. Uh, so you're assuming that the virtual function bodies are in the same shared object as the vtable. Uh, would the static link fail if that's not true? And what about CXA pure virtual? So I believe um, that's the main reason for why we want to use the PLT entries, because 
a BLT entry is always guaranteed to be within the uh, uh, the same binary as the VTable. But this wouldn't be the case if we instead used um, a reference to the function itself, because um, as mentioned, it can be defined outside of uh, a binary if we were to use a direct reference. And that was also the case with the RTTI object, or that was also the case with the type info struct. So it's helpful to leverage stuff like the PLT and the GOT so that we can guarantee um, we're using references to potentially external things uh, correctly. OK, uh, we have another question from Nathan. Uh, does Fuchsia have to deal with simple interposition? Uh, and if so, how does that work? Um, I actually do not know uh, the answer to this. Um, Peter, would, would you be able to comment on this? Uh, not not at this point. For the... <laughs> yeah, uh, not at this point, no. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I can't provide a full answer to that. Uh, so another question that we have uh, is uh, from Arthur Eubanks. Uh, so Arthur is asking uh, whether the experimental part uh, of the flag name uh, should be removed. It, it, it definitely should. Um, the experimental was there mainly for, uh, I guess, legacy reasons back when I was still um, incrementally pushing patches. But seeing as um, it's no longer an experiment and we're using this fully in Fuchsia, then it should definitely be removed. It's just uh, I never got around to uh, actually submitting code to remove it. OK. Uh, another question we have is from Jake Ehrlich. Uh, did you try rebuilding the latest uh, Chrome or Chromium? And if so, uh, what improvements did you see there? Oh, um, I believe the latest Chromium on Fuchsia should uh, already be building this since um, Fuchsia targets already use this API by default. Um, I had time, and I saw a lot of um, I saw a lot of memory and space benefits, uh, which I shared on the slides. Well, space benefits uh, for the uh, um, uncompressed size, but uh, not for the compressed size where there was regression. Um, Chromium was, uh, I believe, one of the driving factors for using relative e tables because unlike, I guess, the Fuchsia, just the system, Chromium itself uses a lot of e tables under hood. So we got a lot of... Um, we get a lot of savings there, and that's where most of the memory benefits come from. OK, uh, we don't have any other questions from attendees, uh, so I'm going to ask one of my own. Uh, so you mentioned that we can cut the size of VTables in half by using 32-bit offsets. Um, for sufficiently small programs, could you go even further and maybe use just 16-bit offsets? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... Theoretically, it should be possible, I believe. Um, I imagine that uh, um, I haven't like put any dedicated like work or effort into uh, looking to this type of solution, but theoretically, it should be possible. And I imagine um, work might be needed similar to the work effort that I went through, like some relocations that might be necessary for your target, um, any lowering of any other IR constructs. Um, it should be doable, but uh, from a purely theoretical standpoint, I think. OK, uh, we have one uh, last minute question from Michael Dorgan. Uh, is there any worry about the 32-bit limit uh, for G limit for jump ranges? Jump ranges? Um, I, think, um, I think I'm not familiar too well with uh, jump ranges. I guess I'd have to ask for more detail uh, on that later, but maybe we could discuss offline. Uh, OK, uh, so that's all the time we had. Uh, thank you again very much, Theo, for, for the great talk uh, and all the answers. And thank you, everyone, for attending.
Thank you.